And thanks very much indeed for joining us today. Um, if we look at uh, this wealth report overall, it's probably no surprise that uh, the, there, there are more wealthy people coming now from the uh, fastest growing countries like uh, India and China. But where is the wealth coming from in those places? Where do you see the high net worth individuals making money? Well, I mean, the main drivers here, Andrea, are basically the G strong GDP growth in these countries. You know, rapid 6.5%, uh, 7% on average in the APAC region, well ahead of anything seen in the developed world. Also, the fact that these equity markets have been making significant progress, particularly in 2010. That's another driver. And also the rate of saving in these countries, basically personal savings. So those have been the three main drivers. It's a really a reflection of economic success. Mm. Now, high net worth individuals were obviously uh, badly affected uh, by the economic crisis. Uh, has it changed the way in which they now want their money to be managed? And do money managers, wealth managers, have to adjust to the new world? Well, yes, there's been very fundamental uh, implications or impact from the crisis. A rebuild of trust and advisors is taking place, but one aspect of the study we focus on this year is actually the enterprise value and actually leveraging the total firm to the customer, involving not just the wealth manager on their own, but also the investment bank, the corporate bank, and particular points of reference in relation to cross-function uh, expertise, access to funding, very specialist, sophisticated um, solutions, um, as well as obviously in private equity, etc., access to, 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 to opportunities, specific opportunities. And the challenge of uh, the wealth management business is to bring those various strands and elements together to actually to deliver a total service that is most appropriate and more tailored to the specific needs of the customers and the client. Now, risk is part of that, and risk management is part of that. And in terms of risk management, are clients simply more risk averse than they were before Lehman Brothers? Generally, yes, but if you look actually at the allocations um, through, say, 2007, 2008 and into our expectations for 2012, you are seeing a drawdown uh, on cash, possibly in some areas, real estate as well, and a switch in favour of equities. That has that been notable. So there is a recovery there taking place. Yes, there is a, a, a less, less of a way of a risk appetite there than there was five or six years ago, but you are seeing the superior returns of some of these asset classes getting a response across the, the high net worth uh, population. Now, if we look at uh, one of the areas that's of most concern at the moment uh, in, in Europe, uh, is your feeling that the policy makers in Europe have actually made the crisis worse through their response to it? I think at the end of the day, to, to us, it seems as if the piecemeal process is, is proving challenging. Um, there is really a need for a systemic response to this, uh, an integrated response to this, dealing particularly with the solvency issue, but also um, growth strategies for these economies that are under pressure, that are, are, are you know, again, having to put austerity programs into place. We're still at the point of actually dealing with contagion risk here. Mm. In some respects, still at the point of dealing with liquidity issues, with the, the old sort of doubt over the disbursement of 12 billion or so uh, in the month of July to actually uh, fulfill the needs of the Greek of the Greek state and the Greek mm. government. So we're, we're still just moving away from the liquidity issue in a sense, still there, um, and, and beginning possibly now to look at solvency. But we have an awful long way to go to look at this from terms of a, an integrated, say, holistic approach that not just looks, at, say, at solvency ultimately, but actually looks at the returning these countries to a sustainable pattern of growth. Mm. Now, how concerned are you that money markets might actually freeze and a uh, like Lehman-style crisis could come out of a Greek default, no matter how prepared the banks say they are? I certainly don't see a Greek, an involuntary default restructuring uh, um, happening in the near term in Greece. I think the, the banking system in Europe simply cannot tolerate it at this stage. It just simply is too high risk. Down the line there may be a process at which we actually look at restructuring again, maybe at some stage in the future, but that's a point when basically um, the allocation of the burden of adjustment is actually more transparent. Uh, it is uh, certainly um, identified by the market um, and where, again, um, the potential collateral damage can be, can be um, uh, assessed more, more accurately. Right now, this summer and possibly next summer, uh, we're not in that position. So for now, I think getting
again, the liquidity issue remains paramount. And maintaining funds to the Greek government um, as they attempt, as we've seen, very to actually uh, return public finances to some sense of stability, particularly around a, a primary budget balance, one where they're no longer borrowing for anything beyond interest rate, interest rate servicing purposes. And where do you see the, uh, how do you see the situation playing out in Ireland? Is there any chance that Ireland is going to end up defaulting? Um, my sense here really is that, you know, again, we're, the, the issues around Greece pertain to Ireland in the sense of basically um, difficulties in Greece returning to pr the private markets for funding will have an influence in Ireland. There's also an issue, of course, that if there is a, a voluntary, um, if, if there is a, vo a voluntary rollover, a voluntary participation, this may have read across, across into, into the, the, the attitude and the, the uh, approach to uh, the creditors and senior, senior bank debt. Mm. There are, I say, read across, there are, there are precedents that are very, very important, both in the negative and the positive, in the sense of basically progress being made in relation to the Greek situation that actually do have implications for the Irish situation. That may, in the next week or so, revolve around the interest burden on Ireland, the interest rate burden. It may ultimately also to, um, uh, be approached in relation to the rollover, the rollover of senior bank debt. So do you think that rollover of senior bank debt is likely to happen in Ireland if it, if it, no, if it happens in Greece? No, I'd just say basically it's something that would be looked at, essentially. Right, OK. Now, um, in terms of investing now in Europe, how does one go about it? Well, we're still of the view, we're still taking a constructive view in the second half of the year. Um, certainly I, our, our, our premise here is that um, the global economy is going through a soft patch. There are doubts, certainly, about the pace of the recovery, but there is no double dip risk. With supply chain issues beginning to ease in, in Japan, with the prospect of some, I think, some progress in relation to the fiscal position in the US later this summer as well, um, I think there is a sense in which basically confidence can be, begin to rebuild. Certainly in some parts of the world there is a very pessimistic view being taken about corporate profits growth, and I, th I do believe that there's value in, in equity markets, but I think from the point of view of focus on equities here from here and the now the year end, I still think there is this sense in which they take a, a dual approach, a twin track approach, where you look to opportunities to um, take out cyclical exposure, particularly those companies that are exposed to the emerging market block, possibly as China, Chinese tightening ends. I'm looking here at basically areas like the industrials, the material sector, to a lesser degree energy, but also focus on those large cap, um, cash rich, high cash flow companies value companies, um, some of them in cyclical sectors, that can provide investors with a steady and growing stream of dividend income. Okay. Bill O'Neill, thank you so much for joining us today.